is three words at the beginning of Jeremiah 31 that uh, are just so powerful. In my Bible it says, at that time. To say with me, at that time. At that specific time. Verse 24, if you go back in Jeremiah 30, says, The fierce anger, indignation of the Lord shall not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the thoughts and intents of his mind. Someone say, hallelujah, amen. Okay, <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, <laughs> if you know me. Uh, but it says, until he has accomplished the thoughts and intents of his mind and heart, and in the latter days, you will understand this. Remember last week, we said you won't understand everything the Holy Spirit has for you until you've experienced the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember? So yeah, Jeremiah 30 verse 24 is saying, The fierce anger of the Lord uh, will be poured out, and he won't turn back until he's accomplished it. And at that time, you will understand it. 30, 30 verse 24, the last verse in Jeremiah 30. Okay, and then it's pointing to Jeremiah 31, verse 1. So God's wrath was poured out on the cross. And then something was released. And that what was released was the full understanding of the Holy Spirit and the full understanding of God's power in our lives. And he says, at that time. At that, say, say at this time. <laughs> because we're sitting after that time. And we're sitting in the fullness of Christ, in the completed work, in the finished work of the cross that was poured out. And so we now have the ability to understand what people of old could not understand. And we now have the ability to receive the Holy Spirit in His fullness. In fact, Jesus says, no greater prophet was there than John the Baptist, because John the Baptist got to point out who Jesus was. And we get to live in the experience of who Jesus is. So all the prophets pointed to Jesus. John said, there is Jesus, and now we have the fullness of Jesus. But what needs to happen in all of our lives is we have to have an at-that-time moment. How many, of you have had a, how many of you have had a specific moment where you know, whoa, God is pouring out his presence right now? Anyone in the room? <laughs> like, Whoa, 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 whoa. God is pouring out his presence. So Jeremiah 31 is my personal testimony because it's the first time in my life where I experienced an at that time moment so clearly. And this is what happened. I, I was playing drums in, a, in another church. I was still in, I was first year varsity. And how many of you know that first year varsity is not the most clear place on earth? If you've been <laughs> out of school for one year, you're like, God, I'm just going to do whatever is happening. Uh, and I decided to study BCom accounting because there was lots of money <laughs> in being a CA. I was with friends. So they, they were like investment management, BA accounting. That's where you need to be. And so... But I never took accounting at school, so it makes total sense for me to study <laughs> BCom <laughs> accounting. <laughs> so, so I end up in this, um, in this, in this, you get like accounting 101 or whatever, and, and then you get one that's for people that didn't do accounting. It's not for dumb people, it's for clever people. Um, sorry, I need to, uh, the reason I say that, sorry guys. Um, there's no way to blow your nose dignified in a dignified way in front of <laughs> in front of people. <laughs> so, it's the greatest fear that I have right now. Believe me. <laughs> yeah, just hold on. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's for clever people because you have to study what what you've missed in all of school. You have to study in six months. And then in your second six months, you have to study everything you missed in the first six months and what everyone else is studying in the second. You have to study with them. So I don't know if it was God speaking, but in April of that year, I realized it's too much for me. <laughs> <laughs> 
And uh, our class, because there weren't many clever people, was in the theology building, which, if you know, is not the theology section at, at, you know, at Tuckies, isn't the most popular course. So they have the smallest hall. So yeah, we sit, this small class of accounting students, in the theology building, and God says, you're in the wrong place. So I'm like, okay, I'm in the wrong place. I, I feel it. It's one of those at that time moments. So I walk outside and, and I say to God, God, if I'm in the wrong place, then you need to show me very clearly where to be. And so I go to band practice and we finish band practice and the worship leader comes to me and he says, I enjoy playing with you. Don't you want to move to Cape Town? Because <laughs> I'm going to start lead worship. I'm going to go, I'm, I'm moving down to Cape Town to, you know, our church is branching out and we're going to start a new campus down there and don't you want to just come with? And I'm going, God, well, I'm not saying God yet. I'm like, okay, yeah, great, sounds cool, cheers. But it can't leave me. It, it cannot, you, you know when something just doesn't want to leave you and, and it's just there and it, it's... So that night, I am, I'm, I can't sleep and... Uh, I, don't know, I know now that it was the Holy Spirit, but I, I thought back then it was just nerves and whatever. And I dare God. I'm like, God, I'm going to go make tea. And if you're speaking, you better give me a scripture that confirms. Like, like I'm, I'm challenging God. So I'm pouring my... I, and I want to just say, I didn't have a living experience of the word like I do today. I, I didn't have... Jeremiah was the same to me as Joshua. I mean, I'm like, <laughs> and God says, read Jeremiah 31. So I'm like, okay, fine. I'll make my tea. It says, at that time. And then I'm reading, yeah, blah, you know, the people and the Lord. And, and then this verse 6, just, but I want you to see this. I said, I told God, your scripture must say, you must give me a scripture, but it must say, go to the mountain. <laughs> it must. I'm, I, it, it. So I start reading, and it starts to say, at that time, and the Lord appeared, and, and I've loved you, and, and I read that, I just shared that, I'm going to get back to this. And, and start, verse 5 starts to just prick my attention. It says, you'll plant vineyards upon the mountains and the planters shall plant and make fruit and enjoy and it says there'll be a day when the watchman on the hills and when I read that I broke I started crying because I challenged God it must say go to the mountain and it didn't just say go to the mountain it said watchman well it first said vineyards and then it said, watchman on the hills. And when I was born, my dad wanted to give me the second name, watchman. And <laughs> this is my mom. She knows. <laughs> and luckily my mom knew that watchman would be embarrassing as a second name. <laughs> But my dad found a bypass. He found out that Gregory means watchful. So my second name is Gregory for watchful. So now it's like literally the watchman will be on the hills. Now I'm like, now I'm crying. Now I'm like bawling. And it says further down, behold, I'll bring them from the north country. That's, that's Pretoria. <laughs> 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 and gather them from the uttermost parts of the earth and among them will be the blind and I'll cause them to walk by streams of living waters and bring them in a straight way for I will not stumble and they shall come in verse 12 and they shall come and they'll sing aloud because I was going down for worship and they shall flow together and be radiant with joy over the goodness of the Lord. For the corn, the juice, the oil, and the young of the flock, and the herd. 
and their life will be like a watered garden, and they will, they will not sorrow or languish in it anymore. And that was the first time I had a real, at that time, specific moment. And it transformed my life. Because it awakened the scripture. Because suddenly I had an experience and I could go back. And now with ease I can say, my name is written in the book of life. Because, <laughs> <'cause> Jer- <laughs> All right, because Jeremiah 31 is, was written for me. You're not, no, <laughs> no it, it was written for us. It, it's a prophetic word, but God used it to speak. And this past while, we've been speaking about obedience, preparing our hearts in obedience, preparing our hearts in enthusiasm, preparing our hearts with joy. And then since worship night, he's been speaking about the Holy Spirit and a specific moment that is coming and the need for us to be in the presence of God and hear his presence completely. Man, God is preparing us for an at that time moment right now. He's preparing us for a, an, an, how many of you, I'm not, I was saying, I was going to start off the sermon asking, how do you know it's your time? And I realized that's not a good question to ask, <laughs> but, 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 but he's preparing us as a body for a specific movement that's going to rock this world, that's going to shake this world, that's going to change this world. And so that scripture for me was a confirmation scripture, but when we started leading this church again, God put that scripture right in the front again. And he said, now it's the time for the church to walk into that verse, to to walk into this passage, to walk into this promise. And it says in, um, in, uh, I just want to get to verse 4, it says, again I will build you. God is building the church again. And he's, he's doing it now, right now. Turn to the person next to you. Say, God is building the church. <clears throat> what that means is, if you don't know what that means, it means God is going to reestablish the church as the center of influence, as the center of hope, right across the world. And the church is going to walk out of its staleness and out of its tradition into its influence, into its power. And if we're, the, if we're one of the first churches, we're, we're part of many churches, but there is something happening we, we're realizing we're not just waiting to die and go to heaven. We've realized that God wants to pour out heaven into our hearts so that we can demonstrate God's goodness and his presence. And so he's building this church to do that. And then verse 4, it says, So you will again be adorned with your timbrels. Okay, God is adorning us with the sound of praise. He's a ad- He's adorning us with the sound of his presence, not just with the silence of his presence or the feeling of his presence, but there is a sound of his presence coming. It's an at this time moment. So last week after Sunday, I I just started, I often just, turn on, uh, you know, Bethel in the evening, because then they're in their morning service. I just want to know if we're, like, still, like, hearing the Spirit, you know, if we're connected. (laughs) And um, Dan McCullen was teaching, and he was teaching on Kairos time versus Kronos time. God's time versus our time. And and I want to just explain or bring an understanding to, to what Kairos time is. Kairos time doesn't work like our time. Kairos time is God's time. And Kronos time is the time you know. You know, it's like you have to be at school at 7.30. Um, We get there at 7.29 every morning. (laughs) That's Kronos time. Uh, And so often people plan their futures according to Kronos time. So they say, well... For me to achieve something, I need to do X, Y, Z. I need to study BCom accounting. And then, okay, me, me, Daniel, Kronos thinking. I need to do this, to do that, to do this, to do that. 
and then that. How many of you have worked out those formulas? <laughs> okay. And then how many of you haven't seen those formulas happen, you, you know, like as you thought? And, and so we, what happens is if we, if we focus on, on the world's time, on the world's way of doing things, on Kronos time per se, we, we actually don't allow the Holy Spirit to, to bring in His time. And His time is not an excuse. Let me say that. There's many people that actually just are very bad at managing their lives and then they say things like in God's time how many of you have heard that (laughs) so it's not an excuse God's time is real God's time requires action God's time is often a listen if you don't do this now time you're going to miss this time (laughs) so often it is that because you've got to be listening to the Holy Spirit and you've got to be acting in that time. But it's a, it's a, it's a wow, this, this is the time. So obviously, I, you know, God said go to Cape Town. There was a problem. I had a girlfriend. Her name is Bernadine. <laughs> and her mom was saying, don't worry, there's lots of fish in the sea to her. <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> she would she would say I'm a nice guy, but there's lots of <laughs> luckily today she says I'm the best squincian ever. So you know <laughs> she only has one daughter, so I'm the only squincian. So <laughs> me and my mom get along well, squin mom. But if I'd made a decision according to my time, I would have said, well, I've told this girlfriend that I want to, she wasn't just a girlfriend, she, she was someone, I said, I want to marry you one day, let's be friends. So, so there was something there. And if I work it out, it's okay, well, then we, you know, have to pretend like we're dating and, and then we have to work our relationship out in a certain way and one day I'm in, and God's saying, my time. So two years later, I'm in Cape Town. I've been trusting God for an income for two years. Nothing makes obvious sense. And I'm standing paying for my cheese and my white bread. That's pretty much what I ate, cheese and white bread. (laughs) I probably weighed 62 when I came back from Cape Town. For guys, that's light, okay. And uh, (laughs) and, uh, and, uh, I'm standing paying, and I look up, and there's a picture of a jeweler and a ring, and God says, it's time. So I, I come back to Pretoria, move back, go to now my school and pa, and I'm like, God said, it's time. He said, don't worry, I'll explain to school and <laughs> <laughs> It's time. It, it's just one of those time moments. It doesn't make sense. God's time. I hosted a missionary team, drove them all around. Well, had a bus driver drive. If I drove, it was dangerous. But they drove the bus all around. Missionary team, dropped them off at the airport. They give me an envelope. Inside is the exact amount that I was quoted for a ring. It's God's time. Doesn't make sense in Kronos time. It's God's time. And so there really is just a, a powerful moment. I can just feel that same feeling. I can feel this. It's like I'm popcorn in a microwave. <laughs> there's, this, there's this energy. There is this, this, this opening up of, listen, I'm going to pour out something great. And it's my time. It's my time. God's saying it's my time, and he's saying that to all of us. He's, he's saying, listen, if we're going to ride the wave of revival, if we're going to experience the fullness of God in our lives, then we've got to be listening to that voice and listening to what he's saying over us and in us and through us. It's time, it's time. Verse 8 said, and I read, let's just go to... Um, um, let's just, just say, I just want to just repeat uh, verse 3. Uh, and I, re- I read it out in the ministry time, or just 
quoted in the ministry time, but the Lord appeared from of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you and continued my faithfulness to you. Guys, think about our worship time. <laughs> think about our worship time. I have continued my faithfulness to you. And then in verse 8 it says, Behold, I'll bring them from the north and gather them from the uttermost parts of the earth, and among them will be the blind. Now turn to John 9, and this is just so important. John 9, in the beginning, says, As he passed along, he noticed a man blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he should be born blind? And Jesus answered, It's not that this man or his parents sinned, but he was born blind in order that the workings of God would be manifest. Now, I circled he. The, 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 he was born. I circled him. And that the manifest workings of God will be demonstrated because Jesus wasn't saying all people are born blind so that the manifestation and the glory of God can. He was talking to about this very specific person, this very Kairos moment. He was talking because what happened is Jesus then smeared mud on his eyes and which he made from his own spit. So how many of you know that um, that sometimes Jesus did things that aren't repeatable, okay? <laughs> so it's not common practice, you know, hey, if you're blind, just come to the front. I'm going to spit on this little, you know, on, some, on a poiki here. And <laughs> All right, Jesus was doing something very specific for a very specific time, a kairos moment in time. So what happened is his healing then caused massive debate within the Jewish community. And it started to open up the blind who were in, in, in religious blindness. And it says that because this man was blind and was healed and then was called into the Sanhedrin and they had a whole debate about whether this man was actually healed with Jesus, it said some of them believed but some of them didn't. So there was a real purpose to him being healed for that moment. It wasn't just for his own healing. It was so that a, a, an awakening could start happening within the religious community of that time. An awakening of the fact that Jesus was real and that he had come for a specific time and for a specific moment. And if Jesus hadn't healed that man, the awakening wouldn't have started within the Jewish community and within the synagogue. So he was healed for a specific moment and a specific time. In fact, so powerful was the testimony of that man that when Lazarus died and was buried, Martha or said, or, or the Jewish people that were with the family said, well, if Jesus can heal the blind man, why didn't he, why didn't he stop Lazarus from dying? They were literally pointing back to the testimony of the same blind man that was healed. It was a specific moment. It was a specific moment in time. And so in verse 9, Jesus says, We must work the works of him who sent me. Yeah. Jesus answered him, let me go to verse 3. It's not that this man or his parents sinned, but he was born blind in order that the working of God would be, should be manifest in him. And then he's looking at his disciples, which which today his disciples really represent us in union with Christ, in union with his mission. And it said, we must work the works of him who sent me and be busy with his business while it is daylight. Night is coming when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the world's light. And as I was listening to Dan speak about the difference between Kairos and Kronos time, I realized that there is a fulfillment that is taking place that I never fully understood. But I know that the kingdom of God is being proclaimed right now. I know that the kingdom of God is for now. I know that we're not waiting to get to heaven, but we're rather waiting for heaven to be to be birthed in our spirits, to be implanted in each one of us so that we can walk in that. 
But there's always been this scripture that really confused me. And if you think about it only in Kronos time, it, it points to the end, of the, the end of the world and destruction and judgment. And it's that scripture that just says, there will be no more sun and there will be no more moon. And so I've always got stuck there. Like, but the word says there's not going to be a sun and there's not going to be a moon. But what God is actually saying through that prophetic word is that there will be a time when we no longer rely on the timing of the earth. We no longer rely on the timing of the world system, but we fully rely on God's timing. Because in the beginning, God created the, the heavens and the earth, and he created the sun and the moon to remind us of God's seasons, of his timing. But without the spirit, we rely on timing that doesn't come from him. And Jesus literally says, yeah, as long as I'm in the world, I am the world's light. They will no longer rely on the timings and the systems of the world. But we will rely on God's timing, on his voice. There's a massive difference. There's a reliance on that. Let me just say, your past does not dictate what, your, what lies in your future. What has been built in your life does not dictate what lies forward. What dictates the most where your life will go from this point on is your reliance on the Holy Spirit and His timing and recognizing His timing. And His timing just jumps out at you when you're looking for it. His timing just, you know, how many, you know, there's, there's so many movies about trying to find the secret treasure and trying to find the secret way. And, and really what God has planted in every person is the desire to seek His presence and the desire to seek his ways, and his timing cuts through the timing that we understand. It's an important concept to understand. It's such an important concept. But there's a change that happened in the blind man that is so important for us. And Dan touched on it in his message, and it just sprung out at me in this verse as well. Um, in in um, verse 8 of John 9, it says, when the neighbors and those who used to know him by sight as a beggar saw him, they said, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Uh, first song today, there's joy in the house of the Lord. We hit the bridge. What does it say? We're no longer beggars. I, I didn't plan this. <laughs> Bernadine and I... <laughs> We're not, when, when, I, when I started singing that in worship, I know what God's setting us up for. <laughs> Man, I'm, I'm like standing here, I'm just, whoa. We're no longer beggars. What is the next line? Now we're royalty. So there's a transition that happened in the blind man's life. He used to be a beggar. But he was transformed into a believer. If you turn the page in John 9, Jesus says in verse 37, Jesus said to him, okay, firstly, the guy doesn't know who healed him because <laughs> he never got to see Jesus. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> he never got to see Jesus before the time. And then Jesus heals him and his eyes, but by the time his eyes started working, Jesus was gone. So he wasn't healed because he first believed in Jesus. Some of us have an understanding of, or we think we know who Jesus is. And I would even go as far as say, we miss his act on our life because we're looking for a kind of Jesus. But when Jesus comes in his pure form, he comes in a way that we don't even, we can't understand and comprehend. God wants to give us a new language some, that's why I said, you know, I just realized that sometimes we just need to speak in tongues so that we can get our head out the way. So that we can bring the sound of his presence without first getting our head in the way, our previous understanding of who Jesus is. So he has a beggar and he's, he's healed by someone he couldn't see and had no preconceived idea of who he was. And now in this conversation, Jesus goes light to him. 
And in, in uh, let me just, verse 35, Jesus heard that they put him out, uh, John 9, 35, and said, do you believe in and adhere to the Son of God? And he answered, who is he? Tell me that I may believe in and adhere to him. And Jesus said to him, you have seen him. In fact, he is talking to you right now. And he says, Lord, I believe. And so he was transformed from being a beggar to a believer. Now, you're sitting here in this room going, I'm so glad I'm not a beggar. I'm so glad I, I didn't sit on the streets and beg. But Dan in his message was pointing, he quoted either John G. Lake or someone who preached a sermon on the fact that many of us are beggars when it comes to approaching God. And we're beggars when we come to him. And the reason we're beggars is because we expect God in his nature or, or we have a, a salvation or a gospel that is a come and do gospel. So what we're always praying for is God to come and do. God, will you come and do? 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 And our prayer time and our expectation starts to sound a little bit like begging. But if we embrace that it's God's time and we have a go and do gospel, it starts to change the way we pray. It starts to say, God, how can I be how can, what can I do? God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to step into? And a believer is really someone who understands God's time for his life and isn't asking for God to come and do everything, but he's asking God for the how. Asking God for the provision, not for his own sake, but for the sake of the going. We're built upon the apostles and the prophets. This church is built upon the on, on, And this is what Dan was saying to the churches. I like Dan's name. But this is what he was saying to, to, <laughs> to the churches. And it's something that when we started here five years ago, we said this will be an, apost an apostolic prophetic church. Meaning we're relying on the voice of God to bring his kingdom to us. And we're stepping out with it. And for the first time, I understand the difference of a come and do approach and a go and do approach to God. Suddenly, this man was living a living testimony. He became a go and do testimony. He became a believer. I want to challenge you, if I can. It doesn't mean you must now feel guilty every time you ask God to come and do something. That's <laughs> not what I'm saying. Sometimes we really, I, I cried out this week, I said, God, will you show me that you love me? But God in his nature is also saying, hey, I've, I've called you to the mountain. I've got a place. There is a go element to the gospel. There is a go element to, to the power that is resting on you. We're not, we're not here just to be freed. We're here to be, to be sent, not just sent out. We're here to walk in the fullness of what God has for us. We haven't been called just to, just to be saved from sin. We've been called to actually walk in the fullness of what God has called us to. And when we walk in the fullness of what God has called us to, yes, we walk in reliance on God, but we walk with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead actively alive in us but this is a specific time I don't even know what it's a time for <laughs> but I know it's a specific time that God is speaking to us about this time and getting us ready to step into what God is calling us to be and to do and praise him in in that way I just want to have an, have make a uh, invitation today that if you have never stepped into God's timing, that you will commit to listening out for his voice, to step into his timing. Maybe you've lived a good life. May, maybe you've, you've lived a life that, that, you know, like Nicodemus came and says, God, I've followed everything. I've done everything. What do, I, what do I need to do to become great? Jesus says, well, you need to take everything you own, give it away, and follow me. He's saying, take all of those things that you rely on that you think give you your place of a position and authority 
and follow me and then you will see great things. Our lives as believers must be marked by the fact that we re rely completely on the presence of God and, and not on what the world gives us. Because we can be bound by what the world gives us and we can be limited by it, even with the best and good intentions. He's calling us to live a life of fullness. And it's a now moment, and it's a now time. And I want to invite you to respond. Can I ask the band, can we do that first song again? Um, join the house, yeah, just as, as to finish off and end. I just felt that this morning as we were singing that. But I'm going to just invite you, if you're someone this morning, uh, and, and there's, there's, there's a group of people that I specifically just want to pray over. If, if, you've, if you have never had a Kairos moment, if you have never fully committed your life to believing, to walking in His process, to, to giving everything over, doesn't mean you become less, it means you become more because you step into the fullness of God and His presence. Don't you just want to lift your, just raise your hand this morning. Just, just raise your hand where you're sitting. Um, if that's you, if you feel like, man, I, I want to step into this, just lift your hand up high if that's you. Come on, we've got one, we've got two, we've got three, four. Anyone else? All right, where you are, just stand, just stand. If that's you, that's lifting up your hand. Just, lift, just stand where you, where you are. Father, thank you, just stand. You want to submit, you want to commit your life to walking as a Kairos testament, a, a testament of God's time and call on your life. A testament as a believer, someone who believes and, and walks in the fullness of what God has called, called you to. Awesome, 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 awesome. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit in this place. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. If you're someone who has a testament of walking in Kairos moment, don't you want to walk and find someone that's standing now and just come put your hand on them and just pour out God's blessing over them? If you've got a testament of faithfulness, a testament of trusting in His Word, testament of miracles taking place in your life why don't you just find someone put your hand on them and encourage them thank you for thank you for thank you for thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you holy spirit thank you holy spirit really is just the sweet presence. The Holy Spirit is gentle. He is kind. He is our comforter. He is our leader. The voice of God is powerful. He leads you in victory. He leads you in courage. God has great plans for you even before you were formed. I knit you together in your mother's womb. My goodness has been poured out over you. Your, your, my testament will rest upon your lips this morning. But God is calling us, as He had in the ministry time, just to rest in His presence. He has come to put His hand on our eyes and hand on our ears to see His face and to hear His voice. And in every person standing, there is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is ready, that was made for this moment, made for this day. He has prepared this day and this moment for you. It is His time that is being poured out over you. And so God, I just want to thank You for Your presence poured out. Thank You for Your sense, the sense of Your presence that is being poured out in this room. God, I ask for clear vision and for clear hearing and clear understanding. God, I, I ask, Lord, that you will come and, and break the shackles of fear. Break the, 
break the bonds that have held us in position or in place and show us how big your time is. Show us how great your time is and show us how good your spirit is. Thank you that it is a time for movement. Thank you that it is a time for, for trusting action, powerful action in your presence. Your word says Jesus has come to be a light to this world and that light is being poured out in this room and that light is being shared right now. So Jesus, come and touch us as we stand in faith. Come and touch us as we come into your presence. And Father, you, you've invited us to come and drink of your presence. Your word says, if anyone is thirsty, come to me and I will give them living waters. Living waters that satisfy and bring fulfillment. And we get up out of our position of begging for you for your presence and we walk into the presence that surrounds us we walk firmly and boldly into the presence that is over us and in us and all around us and we thank you that your presence was poured out your word says in these times i will pour out my spirit on all flesh and so this is the time for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is the time for clear visions, for clear dreams, for, clear, for, just his, for clearness in our lives. Because you've wiped away the confusion. And when you wiped the mud off of his eyes, healing came because you gave sight, you gave vision, and you took away that which was unclear, that which cast doubt, and that which brought confusion. And so we thank you for your clarity in Jesus' name. We thank you that you touch our hearts, our minds, and our spirit. Your word goes as far as to say, I will be their God. I will be in them. I will abide with them. I will be in their hearts and their minds and their spirits. And so, Father, we receive your fullness this morning. Nothing less than the fullness of the presence of God. Jesus name Amen 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 God's just pouring out that I just felt that so in the house this morning if you want to receive a prophetic word make sure you sign up at the back for for this the prophetic session afterwards if you haven't yet done so if you need prayer just come to the front but we're gonna just stand together and just worship one more time this morning and just declare that there is joy in the house of the Lord